Hello and welcome back. So through the first few months of this class, we were focused on looking at solids. So we looked at things like uh, Newton's laws and the work energy theorem, and we applied these laws to things like blocks. And in the last few weeks, we focused on gases. So we talked about the ideal gas law and the kinetic theory of gases and thermodynamics. And in this lecture and the next few lectures, I want to look at the third state of matter, uh, liquids and fluids. So one of the basic properties that we use to describe materials is mass. And when we talk about fluids, we have to be a little bit careful about how we describe the mass of a liquid. And the reason is, I give this example down here, so uh, you know, two liters of water weighs twice as much as one liter of water. In fact, it turns out that one liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. So two liters of water has a mass of two kilograms. So the mass of a liquid is a property that depends on the amount of liquid that you have. And this type of property is something that we call an intensive property. It's intensive because it includes the dependence on the amount of the material that you have. And what we would like to do is we would like to come up with a property that does not depend on the amount of the liquid that we have we would like to come up with some type of property that describes the mass of a liquid in a way that doesn't depend on the amount of liquid we have. So if we go back up here to this example, I say you know, one liter of water has a mass of one kilogram, and two liters of water has a mass of two kilograms. We could keep going with this, you know, three liters of water will have a mass of three kilograms, and so on. But the basic idea, you know, the, the general statement that we could say is that uh, water has a mass of one kilogram per liter. And that's a statement that is always true. That's a statement that does not depend on the amount of liquid we have. That's always true that for every uh, liter of water, you'll have a mass of one kilogram. And this is what we call the mass density. So mass density describes the mass per unit volume. And I should point out that mass density is a property that we could also use to describe other states of matter, like solids and gases. But it's a property that we will need in order to write down mathematical relationships for liquids. So here I'm just formalizing this in an equation. So we have mass density is equal to the mass of a material divided by its volume. And this letter right here is the lowercase Greek letter called rho. And when I'm writing my equations, I'll write it like this. So this little curvy P is how I write rho. And as I say here, mass density is a property of the material itself. It doesn't depend on the amount of the material that you have. And these types of properties are called extensive. And that means that it excludes the dependence on the amount of the material that you have. Now, as always, whenever I introduce a new quantity like this, uh, I always want to look at the units of this. So we have that the equation for mass density is it's equal to the mass divided by the volume. And remember, dimensional analysis tells us that the units on both sides of the equal sign have to be equal. So we have that the units of mass density have to be equal to the units of mass divided by the units of volume. So the units of mass are kilograms and the units of volume are cubic meters. So we see that mass density has units of kilograms per cubic meter. Now it turns out that our unit of mass that we use in the SI system, the kilogram, is actually defined in terms of the mass of water. So it turns out that uh, the kilogram was defined as the mass of one liter of water, and one liter of water is 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. So using this definition for a kilogram, we know that the density of water is going to be equal to, it's, remember it's equal to mass divided by volume, so when we have one liter of water, that's 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters, the mass is 1 kilogram. So this means the mass density for water is always 10 raised to the third kilograms per cubic meter. And this is a pretty good number just to have in your head because we'll be talking about uh, water a whole lot. So the mass density of water is 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples. This first example says, a silversmith can pound silver into very thin sheets that are 3 times 10 to the minus 7 meters thick. How large of a sheet can be formed from 1 kilogram of silver? 
and we're given that the mass density of silver is 10,500 kilograms per cubic meter. So the basic idea is that we know mass density is equal to mass divided by volume. And we can relate to the area of the sheet that's going to be formed by the silver to the volume. So the idea is that we're going to pound the silver into a flat sheet. And let me kind of just draw a little picture here of what's going on. So the silver is going to get pounded into a flat sheet like this. And this volume is going to be equal to the thickness of the sheet, this delta x, times the area of the sheet. So we can use this relationship that V is going to be equal to the thickness of the sheet times its area, and we can plug that into the formula for mass density. And then once we do that, we can then solve for the area of the sheet. So we have the mass density is equal to mass divided by volume, but volume is equal to the thickness of the sheet times the area of the sheet. And so we're solving for A, so I have A times delta X is going to be equal to mass divided by mass density. So delta, I'm sorry, A is equal to the mass of the silver divided by the mass density times the thickness of the sheet. And if we plug these numbers into a calculator, we'll see that the thickness of the sheet is going to be equal to uh, 317 cubic meters. I'm sorry, meters squared. So it's a, an extremely large sheet of silver that you could get from one kilogram of silver. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that uh, the precious metals that we think of, things like silver and gold and uh, copper, this is one of the reasons that these materials were so uh, valued, so, so, uh, so prized uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, because these metals are very, very malleable. And that means that you can actually work with them and you could do things like this. You could actually pound silver into extremely thin sheets. And this meant that people could make very intricate tools, things like gears and jewelry, using silver and gold and copper because it was so malleable. It also meant that you could pound them into very, very thin sheets, and you could use that as decoration just to cover the outside of something. So let's go ahead and look at one more example where we're using mass density. This example says a can of Coke has a mass of 0.416 kilograms and contains 3.54 times 10 to the minus 4 cubic meters of coke, which has the same density as water, which is 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. The question asks us to find the volume of the aluminum can, given that the mass density of the can is 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. So here basically I've just summarized the information that was given to us. So we were given the total mass of the can with the coke in it, we were given the volume of coke, we were told the mass density of the coke, and we're also told the mass density of the aluminum. And what we're asked to do is find the volume of the aluminum can. So the idea is that the mass of the can plus the coke in it is equal to the mass of the coke plus the mass of the can. And now we can write the mass of the coke and the mass of the can in terms of their volumes and the mass density. Right? We know that mass density is equal to mass divided by volume. So this means the mass of a material is equal to its mass density times its volume. So if we use this relationship and we plug it into this equation down here, we see the mass of the coke is equal to the mass density of the coke times the volume of the coke. And the mass density of the can is equal to the, I'm sorry, the mass of the can is equal to the mass density of the can I'm going to write this as rho sub al because it's an aluminum can times the volume of the can. And I'll use al again. And I'm using this notation aluminum. That way it doesn't get confused with a C for Coke. And so at this point, I can actually just solve for the volume of the can because I know the mass density and volume of Coke. I know the mass density of aluminum, and I know the total mass of the whole thing. So if I just solve for the uh, volume of the aluminum can, I see that this is going to be equal to the total mass minus the mass of the coke, and that's the mass density of coke times the volume of the coke. And then I divide this whole thing by the mass density of the aluminum. So what we're looking at here is this is the total mass minus the mass of the coke. So what we have in the numerator here is just the mass of the can. 
and then I'm dividing this by the mass density of the can. So that'll give me the volume of the can. And if I plug this into a calculator, I see that this will be equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 cubic meters. One thing I should point out about a cubic meter while we're looking at this example is a cubic meter is actually an enormous uh, unit of volume. So it's very common that when you're calculating volumes in cubic meters, that you wind up with these relatively small numbers like this 2.25 times 10 to the minus 5. That's pretty normal. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, one liter, and I think everybody kind of has a good idea for what a liter is, is 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. Okay, So a cubic meter is a thousand times larger than uh, a liter. So at this point, I think I would like to end this video. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the relationship between pressure and depth. And this is something that pretty much everybody has experienced before. You know, if you swim to the bottom of a pool, you can feel the pressure of the water that's exerted on your body is greater than the pressure that's exerted when you're near the surface of the pool. So I'll explain why that happens and we'll derive a formula that gives that relationship.